In our last video, we loaded up the urban sound data set. We visualized a few of the sounds. We loaded up and listened to a few of the sound files as audio. And I briefly considered the pros and cons of training on raw data versus uh, some higher order feature set that's extracted. And one of the things that we looked at was extracting the audio out as a spectrogram. And I came to the conclusion that was probably going to be a better bet. As an aside, if you go do some research online, you'll find that there are other solutions and we could jump straight to what's the generally accepted best solution. But I don't want to go there because I find it useful to try things and fail. I learn from failure. Failure is a good thing. Uh, it really reinforces why you can't do something. So I want to try some other approaches to see if they're viable. And if they don't succeed, we'll eventually work our way to the generally accepted solution. OK, that's my thinking. So straight into the uh, the file again, once again, we begin by loading up our required libraries. This is a second notebook that I've created based upon the first, but with some of the cruft trimmed out and that we don't need at this point. So we're going to once again load up the train.csv file. This is as a, just refresh, We this is a file with a series of IDs and the class names that are associated with those IDs. And on my hard drive, I have a directory full of WAV files, and the names correspond to the ID. So here you see on the screen, uh, this ID one is street music. If I look on my hard drive, I, you will find a um, a file called one dot wave, and it's going to be like a, approximately four second or less uh, audio wave file of someone playing music on the street, street music, right? And then there are looks like uh, I've got eight thousand seven hundred and twenty nine such files on my drive. And I won't be looking at all of them because, as it turns out, uh, I'm only going to be reviewing those that are exactly four seconds of, of length for this particular case. So I've loaded up the uh, class names. I printed out the unique class names so we can kind of see what we're dealing with here. Once again, car horn, children playing, siren, street music. I converted them. I came up with a series of numbers to correlate those two, created some lookup tables. It's not as important here. Um, now, in the previous notebook, I showed you how I was using Librosa to convert the raw audio, audio files to a STFT, which is power spectrogram. And I increased the power of the results to decibel units. And that's what I want to train on. Now, the shape of each result for every file that I load is 1025 by 173, which is 125 rows by 173 columns or features. Now I say, let's convert each four second file on disk to a power spectrogram. You'll see this is commented out. And the reason I commented it out was because I've already run it before and it takes like quite a while, maybe an hour to run on my little laptop. Um, and so I thought that's gonna be a pain, but let's just really briefly in here, I'm just checking to see if each is worth, uh, if the sample length is four seconds. And if so, I go ahead and I run through uh, the Librosa functions, and then I add it to this array, and I'm building up that array, which is slow and inefficient. Well, if you use a NumPy array or a traditional Python array, in either case, it's it's pretty inefficient to to build up an array in that style. That's fine. So when I was done, I saved them. <laughs> I saved them off. And actually, NumPy has a nice little save function. So anytime you build up a complex NumPy structure and you think you're going to need it later, you might want to take a moment and save it to disk because uh, it's really handy. So the next time you come through and, and run your notebook, you don't have to actually go through that process. You can just load your data right back up. So that's what I'm going to do here. I've just loaded the uh, saved results. And Let's see what we have here. Oh, what did I miss? CDIC is not defined. Oh, I didn't run every step of my notebook. So let's go back up to the top. Do, do, do. Start here. I've just loaded this back up. So we're going to actually need to, to run each cell. There we go. So here in cell nine, you can see that I'm taking the total number of files that I've loaded that are four seconds in length. Let's just see how many we have there. Train, spec, load, shape. Yeah, so we only have uh, 4,553 training samples out of this, which is, that's, that's how many files we had that were exactly four seconds in length. And so I'm going to split them up 
let's see what I do in this next block. Uh, take the labels. I broke up my test labels and my training labels. So I just took some arbitrarily smaller amount, picked it off for my uh, for my test data set and converted them to numbers. Uh, what else did I do here? I do the same thing with my training data. And I just dropped a few of those out to see what we have here. So once again, we're looking at creating uh, the four data sets that I'll need to use with the machine learning uh, model. And that's, you always have like a, a test and train data set and test and train labels, which are, and they're all going to be arrays of the same length, right? So if it's uh, the training data, you have a thousand training data in your first array, you're going to have like a, a thousand training labels that correspond to those. Uh, so they could be zipped up and they would be, they're, they're paired up sequentially. Okay. Um, and here I said, let's just go ahead real quickly. Now that we've loaded the map, let's verify that we do have spectrograms and that the data loaded correctly. So I just grabbed 12 of them off and I say, let's just print them out. Boom, boom, boom. Once again, we can see we've got the air conditioner, the jackhammer. Da, 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 da. Some children playing, kind of what we expect. And next up. I said, hey, check it out. We now have 3,500 labeled training data samples, 1053 test data samples. I printed out those numbers so I could just kind of easily refer to them. I picked out one arbitrary example and printed it. Okay, and here's, I, I came back at the end of this. <laughs> After running through all of this, I realized it was going to take quite a while to uh, to basically train on the data because it's a lot of data, right? We're looking at each data set. I was originally concerned that training on raw data, it, it wouldn't have been, I have already done my research enough to know that it would have been more difficult to train on that volume of data. But here, actually, we still were talking about 1025 um, times one 73 that's still a lot of spectrogram data so we haven't we've we've narrowed the data set somewhat but not probably enough it's pretty expensive so how did i put it right here i said so uh, we've got uh, 1025 time slices uh times 173 features that's you know 177,325 parameters to pass to the first input layer on my machine, it's a lot of processing. And in the real world, I won't be working with four seconds of audio anyway. So I thought, what can I do to kind of cut this back a little bit? And I said, well, let's just reduce um, let's reduce the, the four seconds. Let's, let's just grab one second of the audio instead. And there's other ways I could have done this. I could have taken and thrown out every third uh, row, basically, and taken a representation. But in this particular case, I just said, and I, and I'm, I think I'm going to try that approach in a subsequent video. But for now, to, to trim it off, I just took the last three quarters of the audio snippet rows and just threw them out. So all that spectrogram data is gone. And now I'm down to uh, uh, just a, a fourth of that. So here I visualize that same bit of information. And you can see this is what our, uh, what was it exam we were looking at here? I don't know if I print out the label for this one, but whatever it is, um, children playing, maybe I think it's, now I have to know. Grab the very first one. It said an air conditioner. Right. So visually with the spectrogram, we can see there's more fine detail, which isn't always a good thing anyway with, with training. Um, and, and many of the examples I've looked at online, um, you're typically trying to narrow it down, actually. So it's uh, kind of down sampling the overall uh, image that you're trying to work with because that's easier to find patterns in if you're uh, training. So here's what our, the, the, the net result is. Um, it's basically just the first 25% here stretched out because to visualize that it, it does that. So we can see this is kind of, this is what our data looks like. And I said, okay, that seems like that's gonna probably work. Let me go ahead and run that against uh, a number of these. So I can just kind of say, do we have something good is the model going to be able to uh, train on this easily, be able to dis distinguish and still find something useful about the differences between these files? And yeah, Jackhammer still essentially looks like the Jackhammer. Um, here's the comparisons. And they actually are quite visually different. So I would think I would have 
better luck training on this these more simplified versions of the files. Right? So I think that looks good to me. So I said, let's give it a try. Let's work with that. So I decided to take my training data. Um, I use this NumPy delete, just kind of trim out uh, the chunk that's in the middle. And now my, my training data shape is now, I've got 35,000 training samples of 150 by 173. So next thing you do, we're going to import TensorFlow and get down to the kind of boilerplate code that you're going to see again and again. One of the steps you always find that you will run through uh, in preparing training data is uh, scaling all the values to be between 0 and 1. So I think that my samples are in the range of uh, 0 to 4, 7. I'm not quite sure, but uh, we'll go ahead and reshape. Reshape. And you see as I reshape, I'm saying... Um, I'm also reducing the dimension dimensionality of the array. So instead of having a three-dimensional array, now I'm basically going to say we're going to flatten this out. It's going to be 3,500 rows, and for each of our, our, our the actual spectrogram data, we're going to use this as a, a, a constant number here. It's going to be one big long array instead of two. So I reshaped it, and then I do this. Uh, I said, hey, is, take float 32 divided by 255. I'll take the number and reduce it to between 0 and 1. Okay, that makes sense. I'm building my initial model uh, using the same, uh, approximately the same parameters that I find in a lot of the introductory um, machine learning uh, examples. I read a book on the Keras library, and this is like one of the the first examples is is very much like this. I may have changed it up just a little bit. I think I'm using the uh, sparse categorical cross entropy loss function rather than the categorical cross entropy because I had some whole numbers in there. But this little function just builds the model. Create an instance of that. The TensorFlow model summary is nice. It kind of jumps out and says, this is how many layers we have. So we can see that we're going to be passing in our parameters, this many over here in the, the first dense layer, and it's going to um, the shape is five twelve. Yeah, so it's going to be reduced to shape of five twelve. Let me just check that again. Let's make sure I understand what that meant. Five twelve. Oh yeah, it's because I specified it there. This is, and then the next layer will end up with an output. This is going to be the output of the layer. This is going to have five, it's going to read our input data, and the output of the layer is going to be an array of 512. And then it's going to go through this next softmax uh, dense layer, which is going to find out of the 10 classes that we have made available, what are the 10 probabilities? What's the most likely, uh, the most likely class that the particular sound that it's encountering belongs to? And so that's what's coming out of this last uh, output layer. So 10 is there. It says uh, we've got total parameters, we've got 13 million, they're all trainable, there's no non-trainable parameters passed in. So the very first thing I want to do is make sure that my uh, the data I passed in the model can make a prediction. This is just to make sure that the data has been structured for, uh, correctly, make sure that the model parameters that I gave it are at least going to spit out something. And, it, it, and that, that was going to be... Uh, that's actually kind of useful um, because if you don't go through that step, you may find you get further down the line. So do a little bit of testing on every step along the way. Every time you make a change to the data set, print it out um, or do, run a visualization to see, you know, how long is it going to, what have I done? Because what you'll find is if you don't do that, you'll have more problems. The further, the further you go, you'll have to backtrack your steps to find out what went wrong. And um, I was actually yesterday when I was working on this, I was stuck for quite a bit, for quite a moment, trying to figure out the proper input shape based upon what I had coming in, the data shape that I had. Because I had one, I knew I had one data shape and I knew it needed to be converted, but to what? And it doesn't really matter as long as uh, as long as long they match. So if, you, if you're training on an input shape that's complex, you just need to be able to feed that to say the input shape is the same complex structure here. 
I think that's the case. Okay. I, I ended up just narrowing it down to being a one dimensional array of the full length of the, so if you imagine I have a grid of data, I've, I've, uh, or a matrix of data, instead of having rows and columns, I've just taken every row and tacked it onto the, the row above. So I end up with just one row, one really long row or an array of, of data. So now we're going through our first training. Um, I went through 20 epics because uh, honestly, this is not working out all that well for me in this. And that's, that's fine, right? So this is how you learn. Um, I passed in my training data, my training labels, and if, with five epics, and I ran it. And what did I get? What was my accuracy? Really terrible, like 40%. Maybe we'll see, where were we at over here? 26% accuracy. That's not good, right? So I, I kept upping the epics. I didn't really take it as far. I, I need to go back and do things like examine all of the uh, the parameters that are going into this and try to tweak them to figure out what makes it better, right? Do I need to downsample my input data more? Do I need to turn up the volume on that more? Do I need to use uh, different um, a different optimizer, a different loss function? Those are all questions that I don't have an answer <laughs> for yet because I'm just experimenting. But at least we're getting this far along that we're actually attempting the training and we can see the training is occurring. And I believe that I end up getting up to about, it's 14, as you can see, it's taking me a while to get through 20 epics. The last time I ran this, my test data, you run your training data, then you run your test data. And I got up to an accuracy of a pitiful 69%, but my, my training data was lower than my test data, which is good, which means I'm not overfitting. So there's at least that. So I think today what I'll get into, um, I'm going to do some experiments on, instead of just lobbing off the last 75% uh, of the spectrogram, I'm going to try dropping all but every other fifth row and see what other kind of shapes I can come up with. Uh, to represent the spectrogram data and still maintain the essential quality of the sound and to see if that improves on my training, uh, if I can improve the, the training uh, accuracy. All right, that's it for this video. Uh, next time, we'll keep on going.